Today, we're going to talk about how I got my job as a producer at YMH Studios. This will most likely turn into a series where I interview people that you probably know in the industry. Who the hell are these people? How the hell do they get these jobs? And what the hell are their backgrounds? And I'm going to do that starting with me. And let me tell you, I just found my initial emails to Tom pitching him on the idea. And we'll go over those. Welcome to another episode of Catching You Up With... The Nadal Itzel Kowitz. I'd like to thank the executive producer of this episode, Wolf Ski Comedy. Without their help, I'd probably be lingering around parking lots as people parked and told them, hey, you know, I'm not necessarily the security of this parking lot per se, but if you, you know, I will look after to make sure no one messes with your car. And if you want to pay me something for that, I will do that. But, you know, I don't work for the parking lot. But because of Wolfski comedy, I don't have to do that. Boy, that was really specific. And yes, that does happen here in downtown Austin. But let's get right into it, dude. So how did I get my job at YMH Studios? I mean, the short answer is luck. But what is luck really if it isn't just being prepared for an opportunity, right? But it took me five to six years of preparation to be able to accept a job like that. So let's talk about how I got prepared. In middle school, early high school, I was always making movies with my friends. And by movies, I mean Terminator movies where I was like the bad guy killing off my friends one by one with big fight scenes at the end. We were really big into Christopher Guest movies. So I remember we, we made like a 10 minute mockumentary about curbside paint job people that painted your address on the side of your curb and how it was super competitive. What I'm trying to say is we were making dumb stuff for a very long time, and I knew that I wanted to make stuff like that. So when I was in college, I went to UC Irvine, which when I was there, didn't have a film program. The closest thing it had was a studio art major, and I did that, and I realized that I wasn't really going to learn anything in college short of how to drink beer without dying and how to be social. Which, college is great for that. I don't know if you guys knew this. I was in the Jewish fraternity. Oh boy, big fucking surprise, right? But I had a couple of brothers in uh, an AE Pi that were uh, also into making movies. So whenever it was Mad Film Dash season, we would team up and would make stuff. And I remember the first thing that we made was a horror movie. Because Saw was really big back then. Our concept was a pledge was... Uh, getting uh, recruited into a fraternity, but essentially he got his pledge ship was getting kidnapped and locked into a room with his other pledge, and they had to like fight to the death, and whoever won was allowed into the fraternity. Look, the premise was really fucking weird, and it was a weird horror movie, and horror wasn't really my genre, but I was like, hey, we're making stuff. I realized too that, you know, all the things that I'm going to learn that are going to make me better at making these movies that I liked making wasn't through classes, but it was through experience. So I knew that I needed to get internships over the summer at like real companies. So NBC Universal had internships that I forget how I got to it. I remember being so stoked being accepted into the program and I had no idea what I needed to do. So you know, that first day we go into orientation and I get like a nice packet that says NBC Universal. I'm like, oh my God, this is so fucking cool. Everyone is like from Harvard and Stanford and fucking really top tier schools. And I'm over here from UC Irvine, which is a good school now. But back then it was like not known for anything that NBC would want from you. McGee of the famed Charlie's Angels, who I think still does stuff. And I think John Lovitz went to UC Irvine. Also very cool. Zot, zot, motherfuckers. That first year, I go to orientation, and we do all that. And, like, it's like a four-hour thing. Like, at the end of it, they all take us on the Universal tram ride. And, like, and I was like, this is the coolest fucking thing ever. I'm seeing things people aren't supposed to be seeing. Like, the movie magic. This is crazy. And then two days later, the directors of the program said, hey, did you end up sending, like, these files that we needed a couple months ago? I was like, oh, I was unaware of that. And they're like, well, you don't have that. So you're not getting, you're not getting into this program. And I was like, wait, what the fuck? And yeah, I ended up working as a bag boy grocer that summer because I didn't have my paperwork in order. And let me tell you, built a lot of fucking character that summer. 
So the next summer came around and I was damn sure all my paperwork was going to be filed in order and super early. And for the next two summers, I entered at NBC Universal. I worked on two shows that were run by the same company on the Burbank lot. And uh, those shows were Open House LA and First Look LA. And I still think versions of that are still airing. But the important thing about those internships is I also learned what it was like to actually work in a place with a whole bunch of people trying to make something. Here's what you need to be successful in probably every career. 50% of what determines whether or not you'll have a good career is are you a good hang? Can someone stand being in a room with you for eight hours straight? Because I'll tell you what, I've made a lot of my hiring decisions based on that. I'd say 30% is actual skill level, like are you good at what you do? And for me, 20% is caring. Do you care about what you do? Do you care that this is going to come out well? If you fuck something up, how does that affect you? I could photographically tell you like most of my mistakes because they were burned so deeply in my head. I thought this mistake was going to be the thing that gets me not asked back to the next project. And when you have that mentality and you care a lot and that every mistake that you make is going to fuck with your money, you care a lot more. Those three things will get you very far in life. But during those internships, I met my mentor. And that, I can't tell you how important it is to find a mentor. Someone that sees themselves in you. They see a younger version of them in you. And they're like, oh, with the right guidance, this person could have, could have a great career. And I know that I wouldn't be where I am today without my mentor. I'd say his name, but... He's not really a public person. I'm not going to say it, but yo, JJ, what's up, dog? My mentor let me edit segments and like do rough cuts of stuff. And it, like I was learning like, oh, this is the proper way. This is what actually each job is. I'm probably now in my last year of attending UC Irvine. And I keep on joking with JJ. I'm like, hey, you say the fucking word. I'm, I don't need to go back to school. I'm not learning anything there. Offer me a job. I'll quit school and I'll come here. I was so fucking hungry to get started working. And one of my best friends in college, he was in computer sciences and he was the first employee of the company's called Weed Maps. And they were essentially the Yelp for medical marijuana dispensaries. You know, as he was working there, I was like, yo, dude, tell them they need a video department and that I should run it. And I remember just saying that so fucking much to him. Eventually, he pitched it to his boss who started the company. We had conversations and he was like, yeah, you know, I'm thinking of doing X, Y, Z. Here's a batch of videos, like edit these together for me. From there, they offered me a full-time job. So I was like, shit, it's the most fun you never want to have again. <laughs> I didn't smoke weed with Tommy Chong because I think he was taking a, t a tolerance break back then. Uh, I smoked a blunt with Snoop Dogg in that period. Uh, dabs were first coming around back then, around 2009, 2010. At least that was when I first started seeing it. And I was in the room when we gave B Real from Cypress Hill his first dab and literally got him too stoned for his 420 concert, which they blamed me directly for. But I'll make another video about that because that's a whole wild story on its own. I remember I just really started hating the content I was doing because I wasn't I wasn't making things that I'd watch. And I realized that really there's just two things that I'd want in order to consider myself successful. Make things that I would watch with people that I don't hate. And most people are lucky enough to be able to check one of those boxes. So in a combination of that and the fact that I realized that I wasn't really learning, like I was my own department and I was hiring people that I went to UC Irvine with to be their bosses, but like... I remember I was getting a lot of anxiety of imposter syndrome where I was like, I don't even really know how to run a video department. This is all going to come crashing down. I need to get the fuck out of here. I need to go back to fucking step one and actually learn the way that everyone else in the industry learns. So I quit Weed Maps. I moved back home uh, with my parents in Los Angeles and I started just taking whatever work I can. I hit up my old mentor telling him I want to get into post-production. I'll do shit for free. I just need experience because I knew... When you first start in entertainment, your goal can't be, hey, how do I make money? Your first goal needs to be, how do I expand my network? Because your, ne your, jobs, your next job is only as good as your network. And so I just started taking on every single job that was offered to me. I didn't care how low the pay was. I didn't care if it was free. 
I knew I needed to start finding people that I liked because they're going to go on to other jobs. Every single one of them is going to go on to other jobs. And at some point, one of them is going to be asked, hey, do you know any assistant editors? We need an assistant editor. And they're going to think of me. So some of the first gigs that I got was uh, was being the night shift for uh, a company that made films and sold them to Lifetime, the Lifetime channel. They would film all day, and then they'd call me around 8 p.m., 9 p.m., 10 p.m., 11, midnight, and they'd be like, all right, we're wrapped for the day, and I'd meet them at the office. They'd give me a hard drive. Or no, 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 they would just give me cards, and I would start transferring all those cards onto hard drives, backing everything up, syncing everything, and then sending all that, and then dr physically driving that hard drive to the editor's house and then driving back to my house. So I'd probably get home somewhere between 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. every day. And I did that probably for fucking four or five movies before I started getting, you know, other jobs offered to me during the day. Because let me tell you, night shifts, it's terrible. So fast forward a bit. I'm taking on any and every job I can. My network is expanding quite a bit. I'm able to start saying no to jobs that I don't want to take and starting to exclusively take jobs that I do want to take. And what I became was an assistant editor. And there's a path. You know, you become, you start off as a post-production intern. From there, you go on to an assistant editor. From there, you go on to an editor. And then from there, you probably stay, or maybe you'll become a post-supervisor. Like, that's somewhere that you could decide to be. And that was the path that I wanted to go on, because that was the only thing that I knew. And eventually, uh, I found a unicorn gig, something that doesn't really exist in the industry, a steady Monday to Friday job that is eight hours a day that you don't need to worry about if the gig ends that, you know, your job ends because the company that I worked for, it was called Digital Kitchen. Um, they were creating all sorts of content for AT&T Uverse and that was their bread and butter. And they were, and you know, they needed a whole entire support team for that, but it allowed them to stay afloat and do a lot of other really cool fucking things. Um, they did a lot of uh, main title sequences. They did the one for Dexter. We did the one for uh, for Narcos. Uh, the one that I helped on was Narcos season one. And I remember working on that was so fucking cool, but it also ruined it for me because we got all the episodes ahead of time. And they were like, hey, find me whenever this guy talks. Find me all this stuff. So I'm literally just scrubbing through all the episodes, like not in a natural, like at like two or three times speed to look for the things that I'm being asked for. And it's just ruining the entire show for me. But the coolest thing about that is I remember I was this close to being a Colombian officer standing in front or behind a table full of cocaine. Um, but I didn't get that gig because there was uh, an Indian guy that we had on staff that worked in the graphic department. Let's just say he looked a lot more Colombian than me and can fit in the uniform. And look, I'm still on good terms with Harshit, but dude, if you still, I'm, I, if you want to catch a fade, dude, we can meet up, dude. But you know, I had worked at Digital Kitchen for now like a year and a half. I had steadily climbed up to being the lead assistant editor. <sighs> and then AT&T merged with DirecTV which meant massive layoffs for the whole company. And unfortunately, I was on that list. I'm just starting to think like, fuck, what can I do? So I start hitting up all of my network. Of course, the entire industry was dry and I couldn't find any work. So I started thinking outside of the box. I was just getting into podcasts. This was back when most podcasts were audio only. And I remember thinking, I'm like, God damn, I want to see what they're watching. And I want to see their faces reacting to it. I hit up a couple podcasts. I definitely hit up uh, uh, the Your Mom's House email address, uh, <laughs> which I'll get into in a little bit. I'm forgetting who else. I feel like I might have hit up How Did This Get Made, the 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 movie review podcast with Paul Shear and Rob Hubel. Wait, was Rob Hubel part of it? No. It was Jason Manzoukas and June Diane Rayfield. I think those were the three hosts, but I hit all of them up and, and Tom was the first person to respond back to me. But what I'd like to do right now is show you what these emails look like, because Tom responded to one of my emails asking for a job. Um, but I'd sent multiple ones. So check this out. <laughs> 
I had emailed Tom one, two, three, four, five. I'd emailed the YMH email five times, and on the sixth time was when he responded to me. So let me, <laughs> oh my God, this is so fucking cringe. So here was literally my first email to the Your Mom's House podcast asking for a job. Hey, Tom and Christina, huge fan from listening to you guys. Seems like you guys could use someone to handle all the technical stuff like Rogan has on his podcast, Jamie. Oh, yeah. The subject of the email was let me be your Jamie. Oh, God. Um, I wrote, I could be the guy that pulls stuff up on YouTube that you guys talk about and just help with technical stuff in general. Plus, you guys don't need to pay me until you're rolling in it. But, like, you totally could if you want to. Ha ha. Oh, my God. Ugh. That's real pain. That's real pain. You guys just uh, heard me sigh. Terrible. Here's a link to some stuff I've done uh, if you guys are interested. So I sent them uh, a link to an episode of Epic Meal Time that I had, I think, edited or worked on. Um, there was an episode of some show that was on Hulu that I had, epi- that I had edited. Um, there's some web series stuff that I had edited. And then I sent them my IMDB, uh, profile link. And I said, really hope to hear from you guys. And that was in June of 2014. Holy shit. I didn't start working for them until February of 2016. So I'd literally been chasing this job for two years. That's insane. I didn't even fucking realize that. The next email get sent in August of 2014. The subject of this one is, let me be your producer for free slash cheap. But I wrote, uh, hey guys, I'm a huge fan. I've been listening since episode 100 when Segura talked about the Winnipeg bombing on the Rogan podcast. I heard you guys saying you needed a producer to go through all your emails. Let me be that dude. Uh, We can even call me an intern. You don't even need to pay me. I just want to be part of it. Oh, God, this fucking hurts. I'm 25 and just want to keep busy with things I enjoy doing. This was literally 10 years ago. That's fucking, that's fucking crazy, dude. The next sentence is, my skills? I'm mostly a video editor, but I get technical things easily. I could be like what Jamie is for Rogan, which is... Boy, if I, if I if only I knew then what I know now that Googling is so much fucking harder when you're on the spot, but <clears throat> oh my God, oh my God, I'd like to think I'm funny in a stupid sort of way, but I'm also biased, so probably can't trust my opinion. Why would I write that? For about three months of my life, I was seriously attempting to create an iPhone app that kept track of how much money you made while pooping on the job, so there's that. Oh my god, I completely forgot about that. I was call I was gonna call it the number two time card. It was like like I was really close to getting it developed. <laughs> Anyways, if you guys ever get to reading this, feel free to call me or just email me back or whatever. And I had not put any links to my previous work here. So it's literally just take my word for it, guys. I'm good. <laughs> oh, he didn't respond to that. Oh my god. Next email I sent was just a submission. Oh my God. I'm getting lightheaded, lightheaded from how cringy this fucking is. I sent another submission for the show. This submission was sent in April of 2015. So here is the email that I sent that actually got a response from Tom uh, that led to them hiring me. All right. So Jesus Christ, man. And this is honestly the best approach that I think anyone could take. Keep it short. Keep it simple. Elevator pitch. No one wants to read a fucking essay. And they want to know immediately, like, oh, this guy is on his shit. So the subject of this email, God, fucking young Jamie really was my entire fucking selling point. But the subject of the email was, you guys want a Jamie for your podcast? This is the email word for word. Sup, Kane. Been listening to you guys since Mom Segura went on JRE and talked about the Winnipeg bombing. My name is Nadav, born and raised in LA. I've been in post production since 2010 as an assistant editor and have been a big stand up nerd since before then. I really love you guys. 
You're the main podcast I look forward to every week. No, I'm saying. <laughs> and would love to help out in any fashion. No, I'm saying. We could do live streams, set you up on YouTube, or just video record the podcast and release them same day as the podcast. No, I'm saying. Oh, my God. Even this shit's fucking cringy. Christ. Uh, anyways, I'm sure you guys get emails like this all the time. But I figured it was worth reaching out. I attached my resume just in case. Would love to be involved in any way. Let me know. Thanks. Signed, Nadavid Squids. And then I attached my resume, which honestly looked pretty fucking uh, impressive uh, at the time. And I mean, I'll put it up on screen right now just so you guys see what it looks like. You see a resume like this and you're like, oh, this guy works, you know? And like, you're not going to take a chance on someone that doesn't have a history of like, well, do they actually know what they're doing? So I sent that December 7th, 2015 at 12.09 p.m. And he responded that same day at 5 p.m. So lucky for me, I sent that email on the same day that he was looking through that email and prepping for the show. He goes, hey, Nadav, thanks for the email. This sounds great. Can you come by for a meeting later in the week? Maybe Thursday. We're in Redondo. <laughs> and then I forwarded my, I forwarded the email to my brother saying, holy shit, I'm meeting with your mom's house on Thursday. That's so adorable. Uh, but yeah, then I met up Tom for breakfast. Uh, I passed the crazy test and we just kind of started figuring it out from there. And it wasn't a full-time job. And the thing is, is that immediately, even though it was part-time, I made sure that it was priority number one, no matter what job I took. I knew that they recorded on Mondays and episodes came out on Tuesdays. So no matter what job I took, cause I was going back into the freelance market cause I had just been laid off. So whatever freelance gig I took, I made it very clear. Hey, Monday evenings, I I'm unavailable. And yeah, from then on, I kept on doing freelance gigs and did YMH as my main side hustle. And that just grew and grew for about two years. I remember getting a gig as an online editor, uh, at, a Warner Brothers theatrical marketing house. I even worked for a company called Machinima, which is something that old gamer nerds are probably going to be familiar with. I started off as an assistant editor on that gig. And then me and my editor became such good friends and we're making each other laugh so hard that we started making everyone else laugh. And we ended up turning that into a pitch of, because I think they had just signed a deal with Twitch where they were going to have a 24 seven always on live channel and so we pitched like hey why don't you let us be a part of that and like let us host a show and it was called the vr power hour and uh We went live literally every day, five days a week, playing VR games and mixed reality. That's where I met Any. And I remember in the middle of that, like, there were so much resources being put into the VR Power Hour. There was like, it took like 10 to 15 people to make that show exist. And our concurrent viewers were below that. And I was like, I know it's not good if the amount of people that this takes to put together outnumbered the amount of people that actually watch it. To you. Hi, I'm Kit. I'm Dove. And we're gonna show you how to level up your fitness by getting off the couch and into some video games. <laughs> Can we find some water? Utilizing high activity games like Sprint Vector <laughs> and Verzoom. What are you, you baby boy? You little baby boy? Push it, go for it! We will demonstrate for you a VR workout regimen that will take you from this to this. So tune in to get fit with Dov and Kit. Make your, Make your ideal, ideal self, self a virtual, a virtual reality. Virtual reality. <laughs> so I was trying to look for other gigs because that was actually like my main nine to five and I was leaving early on Mondays. That was always part of the deal. I leave early on Mondays to go work on YMH. And then there was, uh, you know, I had that phone call from Tom and Christina one day where they said, hey, we want to expand to it be a network we want to produce multiple podcasts and we can't really do that 
unless you're on board. So what do you say? And I'd literally come to the realization within the last week or two that I needed to leave Machinima. And uh, it was a very quick yes. And then I started uh, going full time for YMH. And slowly, you know, we started adding shows onto the onto the docket. We started with YMH. There was Honeydew. There was Where My Mom's At, Dr. Drew After Dark. We slowly started adding these shows onto the slate. And it turned into what it is to today. And that is how I luckily got my job as, uh, you know, ultimately being the executive producer at YMH Studios. And if you want to do that, I mean, yes, there is luck involved. But you got to prepare for the opportunity to be that lucky. So if you guys are seeing some people in the industry where you're like, God, I'd love to have that job. Start learning today. YouTube will teach you everything you need. You're going to sit through a lot of bullshit, but you're going to learn a lot. I learned this on a job too. This was the the uh, the theatrical marketing uh, company that I was working at. I remember that there was this editor named Tony that was working there. And he was so knowledgeable about everything. And he was around my age, but he seemed to be so much more advanced than me in every department. And I was like, how do you know this much? Because I realized, too, that he was in the industry for a shorter amount of time than me. I was like, how did you get this good this fast? He's like, I just read. I learn. I study. I research. If you go home every day and you spend one hour towards learning, towards your field, within one year of doing that, you'll be ahead of 50% of the people in your industry. If you do that for another year, you'll be 80% ahead of the people in your industry. And if you do that for three years, you will be in the top 5% of the people in your industry. And no shit. He was in the industry for three years by the time I was in the industry for seven years, and he was so much fucking better than me. And I was like, fucking A. Caring. Caring is so fucking important. But uh, that was a really long-winded version of how I got my job uh, as an executive producer at YMH Studios. S tell me in the comments who you'd like to see interviewed for next in the series. Um, but also, mainly, I would like to say thank you to everyone that you're seeing on screen right now. They are all producers of the show known as catching you up with not how it's okay to die and without their help i wouldn't be able to put these episodes out as normally and as consistently as possible and if you guys would like to become a producer of the show click the patreon link in the description below and you know <laughs> i will now take this time also to address last week's episode it was extremely hectic it was fucking out of focus which i hated but literally at 6 p.m the day before and this this show usually takes me two and a half to three days to put together. A lot of research, a lot of writing, and then filming, and then editing. It's about a two and a half day process. And about, let's call it 18 hours from uh, when the episode was gonna release, I had made the executive decision, I cannot release the thing I've been working on for the last three days. So I shot from the hip, I told some anecdotes and stories, and just, Tried to not read from a script and be myself more, and you guys seem to have liked it. But uh, now would be a good time to remind you to leave a comment, a like, uh, subscribe, share this with a friend. It all helps with the algorithm. And um, until next time, I would just like to remind you all. This is a totally unconfirmed news.